tough uh, society essentially uh, it's um its mission is to connect researchers and practitioners and other stakeholders in time series uh, analysis and forecasting. So the idea of this series is to invite experts, academics, researchers and practitioners to discuss uh, relevant problems, research and solutions in time series and forecasting domain. So we can all uh, hopefully learn, um, learn together, um, enable the community to learn about innovations, problem and real world applications and innovate forward so we can facilitate the transfer from research to innovations right so um i'm very pleased uh to uh to have today uh, with us uh, chen uh, shu so for um some of you who are not familiar uh, chen shu is uh, is uh, the inventor and the author of uh, the first um conformal prediction uh model for time series and forecasting back in uh, 2021 20, uh, uh, Chen is uh, a PhD student and uh, together with uh, his um, supervisor, uh, they published a number of uh, very interesting papers uh, applying conformal prediction uh, to uh, time series uh, forecasting. Uh, the first model you probably, many of you have already probably uh, heard about it, it's called NBPI. Uh, it's using uh, ensemble bootstraps uh, to kind of uh, transplant conform prediction from uh, um, exchangeable data to time series as you probably know uh, conformal prediction originally wasn't designed for time series so it was very exciting to see uh, the first paper back in 21 uh, which uh, Chen have presented at the uh, top conference ICML and from there on we've seen uh, amazing development of conformal prediction uh, for time series forecasting as I'm probably uh, uh, you know uh, many of you have probably seen so you know if you go into my repo or some conformal prediction you will see as uh, a whole section so the whole field has been uh, really uh, blossoming since then. And, you know, the good thing about it, it was not just sort of academic research, but we have seen a lot of uh, a lot of implementations in some of the most amazing open source uh, time series libraries, such as, uh, you know, NeuroProfit. We have Mapy, of course, we have Amazon Fortuna, we have Nixla. So we have a lot of very exciting innovations. So, you know, it's a, it's a technology for the future, right, that many companies need in their hands right now. So uh, I'm very excited to have uh, Chen with us today. So he's going to be talking about uh, his uh, more recent paper, uh, which is uh, enhancing uh, conform prediction for time series further. And you know he'll talk a little bit uh, uh, about uh, how it's better and how it's different, right? And you know also uh, sort of give a bit more um, explanations about time series and uh, conform prediction, how they kind of uh, come together. So over to you, Chen. Please, uh, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Larry, uh, and thanks everyone for being here. So before I start, I also want to appreciate TFS for organizing the event. I think it is a great opportunity to connect us as researchers with both other researchers in the field and, and practitioners. So it is a great opportunity. And also I want to thank Larry again because of his like advocate, advocacy for conform prediction. And, the, and I really uh want everyone who hasn't know it to go to his github i think valeri can share your github in the chat which i think is very valuable he has a very good curated list of very various resources so yeah and before i start as well for those of us who just joined i want to uh let you know that i also share my slide on the event page the link the event link is in uh the chat here as well so you can follow the slide download the slide it's also available on my website yeah, okay, so without further ado, let me start. And so the title is called Enhancing Conformal Prediction for Time Series. This is a series of work with my advisor, Professor Yao Xie from Georgia Tech. And of course, my contribution to the field is on conformal for time series, but I don't want to jump straight in because I'm, I'm not sure that everyone is that familiar with conformal, especially like recent development. So before that, I will first give the motivation of why we care about the problem as well as the goal. Uh, including like the warm-up example. Then I will go to conformal prediction for the traditional IID setting. And then I will go to the time series aspect, especially given a lot of numerical results to show our performance. And then I will discuss some extensions and conclusions. So the motivation is simple. So first, we know that nowadays machine learning model can do forecast and the forecasting problems is everywhere. And the disclaimer is that of course, CP itself is not limited to forecast, but I'm just using this as a main example, which is also what we consider. So the example here is here, suppose we have a black box neural network model, which predicts the next day return or any day return to be 5%. 
But however, we know that there is a natural uncertainty in the model prediction. Why? The first, it can be due to low signal to noise ratio due to the market itself, or it can be due to high variation in the data because the data, for example, is a time series, then it is can be highly non-stationary. Or it can just due to the randomness in model fitting, because I know that nowadays when you fit a model under red, under different random seed, it can also give you variation. So all of these are here. But if you just make the model to give you a single point prediction, which is 5% here, it can be highly insufficient. So that is why the question is why we want to, how can we quantify such uncertainty? So in play, in plain term is that can we say with high probability, of course. The probability is user specified then what would be the true return so the true return is of course something we never know but we want a way to quantify this given my train model so in other words the goal is to do uncertainty quantification or uq for forecasting problem but as again it's not limited to forecasting but i'm using this as the main example that i think is the easiest to explain and here we just say the data is a is a tuple of feature xi and your yi. Here we assume the feature is d-dimensional with univariate response. Of course, uh, in principle, people one can extend this to multivariate response, which I will actually explain later. But for now, let's just assume we have a single time series with uh, different features for, for, for the prediction task. And then equation one is essentially what I want to say as the formalism for UQ. What it says is that given a significance level alpha and the new feature xj, which of course in general is something we haven't seen, then we want to predict a prediction interval, which is a function of the, your feature and your significance level, so that as shown in equation one, the probability that the true y, which again, as I want to emphasize that we never know it beforehand, the true y that is in this interval is at least one minus two, uh, one minus alpha. So in, you can you can interpret this in the frequentist sense, meaning if you per, if you construct many such intervals and then you have the realization one minus alpha fraction of the time these intervals will indeed capture your true response. So for example, go to go back to my previous example, it will just essentially say that I suppose your alpha is 0.05, then this says with 95% probability, I want to say the true stock price order return is within my constructed interval, which is the C thing. And as I said, we can generalize to, to in general construct a confidence region when your output Y is a multivariate response. But this can require other work, which I will not cover too much in the work, but I'll ex ex explain it in the extension. So here, before we go to CP, and I think I'm sure we already familiar with the goal, I'll give a warm up example before I explain what is the power of CP and why we care about it. So first, the, suppose your data are IID, and also suppose the true Y, that its dependency on X is a simple linear model with, uh, with IID noise as well. Then in this case, we know because of a linear model, suppose we don't have model specification or whatever, we know what is the point prediction would be by just fitting your beta hat. And in addition, in two, we are also going to know what the true interval would be. It is just center at your prediction, point prediction plus or minus the T statistics times your standard error of your prediction. So this is well studied in the literature. And I, and I believe many of the methods are using this similar idea. However, I do want to point out the limitation of in three uh, in three aspects. So the first is, of course, the linear assumption. In general, we don't never know what your what how does your x affect your y. And in addition, we never know what is the distribution of y, because in two, if we say your epsilon is a normal distribution, we actually we actually know what your y is. Assuming we have a fixed design in the sense that your x i is not a random variable, which, but it's just a feature. And in, in that sense, we can actually know the distribution of y conditionally. But in general, we don't we don't want to impose such assumption. And the second is we have to assume there's no model misspecification. So suppose in even if your y is really a linear dependency on x, but if you're not fitting the true linear model, but using some other models, then there is the misspecification issue. And the third thing is, in the example I showed you, the data has to be IID, which is also a limitation, especially given this context of time series forecasting. So then this goes to the main thing. So can we have something that actually circum circumvent the problem, uh, circumvent the problem above? or the limitation above. And in particular, we will see that conformal prediction in itself can already address question one and two. But then 
also it has theoretical guarantee, which I will show, where we further address three in our work, meaning that we can extend conformal beyond IID data or in general exchangeable. So this is the setup. So this, this may seem a lot of notation, but I will just simply explain what conformal does in a nutshell. So essentially, conformal has something called a conformity score, or in other literature, it can be non-conformity score, but they are essentially similar. So this S is a function of your X and Y and some F hat, which we just treated as something you fitted. For example, your S can be just a residual of the difference between your Y and your point prediction. Then what one does, or conformal set does, is essentially selecting all the Y such that its conformity score is less than the quantile of your previous one. So in the sense that, of course, you have to compute those score on your holdout data. So the detail I would just ignore, but essentially just think intuitively as a way to actually measure what Y is not that strange comparing to the past. So in, in other words, I think the red sentence here is what I most remember or what I tell people. So essentially one includes all the Y uh, with score that is conforming to the past. So this idea originated in this landmark paper. And oh, actually, I think the uh, this citation is a little too new. The, the, the original work is far be be before that. I uh, apologize for that. And also, there has been quite a lot of development so far. And you can find this most comprehensive review for this subject in 2021's uh, re review article. So again, I want to point out the first idea is not in 2000, uh, yeah, 2017. Uh, and in particular, so one here, or in general, one here would not be interval. It would just be a set. But in fact, if you use a residual, you can show it will be a certain offset. And I so so in that in this case, uh, it will be a certain type of uh, interval. So that is why I'm just referring one as interval. And in particular, there are several benefits of one. The first is it is actually distribution free in Y, meaning I don't want to assume anything about how your x and y is distributed, unlike the original IID linear model example. And second, it is also model free. So in the sense that you really don't need to have much assumption. There's very mild assumption on, uh, there's many uh, very wild, uh, very mild assumption on your f hat. And the third is it actually have the theoretical guarantee in the sense that if you produce this interval uh, as, as or this set as explained in one, and then you evaluate the actual coverage in test time, this is actually going to cover one minute of a fraction of the time. And by the way, Valerio, I think I, I'm also monitoring the chat. So I think if, if there's any question you, you think I should answer in a minute, in a while, let me know. I will just stop. Otherwise, yeah. I will just keep going. I think we'll, we'll leave them till then. So we have half an hour. OK. OK, cool. Okay, so then, so this CP idea, as I as I summarizing this slide, of course, it's a very crude one. I just want to give you the idea. This is very good, but however, there is the main limitation of the data dependency. So what I want to say is, and I just want to make uh, in, impress again that this is our assumption on dependency, not distribution. So they are different. So in particular, existing CP requires your X and Y to be exchangeable. For example, ID meaning independent and identically distributed as one specific instance. So in, in general, what exchangeable, uh, time, ex ex exchangeable random variable means that for any sequence of random variable and the permutation of their indices, the joint distribution of these random variable is invariant under you permute them. So suppose we have just three, then, Z1, then the joint distribution of Z1, Z2, and Z3 is equivalent to like Z2, Z1, and Z3 in general. So that is the general assumption of CP. But however, this is why it motivated our work. So what I want to say is exchangeability is very rare for time series because of the strong serial correlation. So for instance, if I have a time series, which I explicitly know my current observation is affected by the past in, in an autoregressive fashion, it is very unlikely that the joint distribution will be the same if you swap them. So for example, if you if I so this is a motivating one where you can just view this epsilon t hat as the non-conformity score or the conformity score I, I ex explained earlier. And then you can first see that the distribution is asymmetric. So this is fine, conformal can deal with it. But on the other hand, you can see the autocorrelation or the partial autocorrelation is also decaying very slowly with respect to lag. So in that case, of course, people can still use conformal existing idea assuming this thing is still exchangeable. But in general, as I, and I was showing in experiment as well, this is not really meaning, uh, it's not a reasonable way to, to use the idea. So that is why 
the extension of CP beyond ID setting or exchangeable setting. So in this work, from now on, I for the simplicity of exposition, I would just assume we in interchangeably use ID and exchangeable. But of course, just bear in mind for those of you who are more familiar with the theory, of course, we're talking about the exchangeable thing. But ID, I think, is more well known. So essentially, how to extend CP beyond ID setting is a general and, and it is a key and a relatively new question. And I want, before introducing authors, I do want to acknowledge some concurrent work. And of course, I believe there are many more uh, because this is an active field, but I, I just want to point out these ones, which I think are more a uh, two lines of work that I see uh, a lot more. So the first is, I apologize, there should be a space. So the first is a, a, they adaptively adjust the significance alpha, a significance level alpha t, depending on how well you cover. So what this means is, uh, suppose originally, if you look at the conformal interval, then it only has a single alpha. Like suppose I want to produce a 95% interval, then this will be 0.05. But in general, if your data is not exchangeable, people in, in this previous work have realized that you can actually adjust the alpha, like slightly lower it or slightly increase it. So that even if your data are not ID, it can still satisfy the coverage guarantee and also performing actually better than the or original one with fixed alpha. So this is one type of line, one line of work. And the second line of work, which actually I will show is more related to ours, is the type of reweighting scheme. So here we assume your alpha is just fixed. So it's still 0.05. We don't adjust alpha as in one. But then we're going to reweight the quantile uh, as because if you if you look at the slide here, let me go back. So here, this is the empirical quantile function of your past one. And when the empirical, how you can view empirical quantile is just you can sort them and then you take the one minus alpha's largest one based on your sorted data. But if you, but in general, you don't have to assume everything, every residual or every score is equally weighted. You can you can assume like if I believe it's closer to my current one, then this should be have a higher weight. Whereas if it is further, you have a lower weight. So this idea has been developed recently, very uh, and especially in this 2022 work, which I think is a general scheme for non-exchangeable data. So and also. Uh, after you download the slide, you can click all these references, and they will point you point to you the last page, which will have all the references. So I do encourage you to check those out. And I want to see that besides this concurrent work, our work is one of the first to understand this problem beyond ID setting, which is actually I want to emphasize it's not in conflict with those work. We can actually combine ideas from these concurrent work. And if you're interested, I can explain more. And in particular, in retrospect, we realize we realize that our methods can also be viewed as a type of reweighting scheme in two. And I will explain that, especially the latest one, the spicy one that, that I will show. Okay, so now I'll go to the main part of my our method. So the first is this initial solution, EMBPI, which hopefully some of you already know. Uh, that was developed uh, two years ago, and we recently extended a little bit. So here we consider time series data, where for time series, you can assume your XI be an autoregressive past D feature, or you can consider other features. So in our papers, we experimented with both. And I think in general, it doesn't have too much uh, requirement on what your XI can be. So this is just some feature you design. And in particular, our method will build on our previous work by, actually, I was also co-author for this one, to build an ensemble method that increased the accuracy of your prediction f hat. Remember, the f hat is a point predictor for uh, your actual response. Without a and in particular, this method is not going to have a holdout set. Uh, I think I didn't explain this exactly, but I want to just want to sh make sure that uh, you, you make sure that in, in existing CP, unless you do some clever way, you have to split your data as well to train your F hat and your other thing, every part. So then what EMBPI does is actually similar to existing CP with some caveat as I will explain. The first is that it's still, in this case, we assume we are using the residual. Of course, you can consider other score in general. And then assuming you are using the res residual, it is still plusing the quantile. But now in this case, first, it's not symmetric because I, we're actually trying to minimize interval width. And the second main thing we realize that is in, in time series setting, you actually have to augment your uh, residual set in a rolling fashion, meaning that I cannot just use, a, we, ca we, can, we cannot just compute a score or a set of score on the holdout set or on your original set and then keep using it. In that case, it would not be adaptive, adaptive enough. So that is why in, in one, we actually in practice are going to roll this 
uh, rolling this curly ST thing. And in particular, we can also show that when you when you are using one, you can have the asymptotic coverage under a consistent training of F. So here, indeed, I want to emphasize the theory, the theoretical aspect is weaker than what existing CP does. This is because in existing CP, first, they are not asymptotic coverage. They're just marginal coverage. You don't have to assume your training data has, you have infinite training data, so that is the idea. And the second, in tra traditional CP, you don't have to assume your training of your F is consistent with this linear assumption. But I just want to emphasize, when we first developed the method, we actually realized to have some guarantee, we have to have something like this. But I want to say that recently, people have been, and including us, have been alleviating such things. And also, you can find the details in the works below uh, in these two works. So the first work is what we originally proposed, and the second work is an extension of this with the main idea similar, but we make every part more rigorous and including additional experiments, which I will also show. So essentially, this slide is a simple explanation of the, what the EMPPI does. So you can view it actually not very different from existing CP, but in a sense of increasing model prediction accuracy with ensemble method, as well as using a rolling set of uh, conformity score. I think now I will explain what the spicy idea does. So, and this is the recent, the most recent development based on the MBPI idea and some other works. So what we want to say here is actually we can do better. So what we mean by do better is if you realize existing CPU or EMBPI, we take the empirical quantile. But in, in reality, we realize going back to this slide, there are strong dependency within your residual or the non-conformity score. So we were thinking, how can we actually leverage the, leverage the dependency among those residuals? In fact, as summarizing one, there is a simple way to do. And I made this slide short to just give the high level idea because I want to, everyone to get the big picture. So in general, what we do is that we still center the prediction at this F hat, which is the, uh, like you can, you can use that as an ensemble model or use it as an other predictor. But here, rather than just adding your uh, empirical quantile fit, uh, taken on your past data sets, we're actually going to fit this curly Q hat, where this curly Q hat is a quantile regression model. And this quantile regression model, I want to emphasize, is, is fitted on the residual. Uh, and when, whenever I talk about residual, it's non conformity score. So again, I want to emphasize this thing is not fitting your regression, quantile regression model on original X and Y, but instead we are fitting it on your residual. And in the next slide, I will explain some of the differences and key remarks. And more detail about how we actually do this idea can, is also here. So this work is the most recent one, and I believe uh, there will be question for this, so I'm happy to take it after I present the whole thing. But essentially, just want to, everyone to make sure this is the empirical quantile of our residual. So, so this equation one is the same. And in particular, people can use many quantile regression methods uh, when you're doing it on residual. In our work, we, we use the quantile random forest and we train it autoregressively. The reason is that when you use quantile random forest, we, we can actually show that you have the asymptotic conversions as well. And in this case, it's, it has a less assumption. We don't have to assume it's asymptotic training or et cetera. So that this assumption is, is much wild, uh, milder than before. So this is what I said. And in particular, we also realize that when you when you compute this thing, because in general, in general, when you after you fit this quantile regression model and then you compute it or you estimate it as a certain or sorry, when you evaluate it as a certain threshold, this is going to give you a scalar. And in fact, the scalar, as we said here, is going to be a weighted quantile on your past residual. So in this respect, we realize it has an interesting connection with this prior work, which is more is more of a theoretical work, which says that suppose your data is not exchangeable, it can be time series or can be others. Then what would be the ideal way to do this weighting scheme? And in, in this respect, we actually view our work as a type of empirical development for this weight for, for that based on that theoretical uh, justification as well. And the last thing, which I think a lot of you are familiar, there was a work several years ago called conformalized quantile regression. And people have been asking us, what is your difference between, between what you propose, like in one and that work? So the key idea is that in their work, they are trying to make a quantile regression model, model fitted into the CP framework. But in this case, we are actually not using that. Your F hat here can be any predictor model. You can use it 
as a point prediction model in your favorite packages or development. But then we are going to wrap a quantile regression on the residual. So it's not on the original time series. So that is the, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I clicked the wrong button. So that is the that is the key idea or the key difference between what we have and this conformalized quantile regression. And I'm happy to explain more. So essentially, I want to give a short summary of what I have done so far. So essentially, the goal is to, we want to have an uncertainty quantification by, pr by producing con a confidence interval or confidence set centered at a certain feature with a significance level for your future response. And I first go through a simple case of using linear regression, but then you have to have a strong assumption on ID data and your linear model with a specific linear structure. And, and then I introduce what is the general scheme of CP, meaning how can we use conformal prediction to do this thing? And then uh, what is the main benefit of CP in this context, but of course, as well as some of the limitations. And then we said, what is the proposed one, uh, proposed two solutions to extend beyond conformal prediction with exchangeable data? So the first thing is we have this EMBPI, which is an, uh, which in a nutshell is our ensemble learning of a point predictor, as well as rolling update of your past residual. And the second spicy idea, which I just said, is you're replacing the empirical quantile by a fitted quantile regression model. So in our work, we use the QRF, the quantile random forest, and we're actually developing for further extensions uh, using other methods to make it theoretically more sound. So, so far, I give you some idea of what we're doing. And next, I'm actually going to examine how well those ideas like the EMBPI and SPICY are performing in practice, because I think this is what people care a lot in reality, especially for time series forecasting setting. So I'm going to ex first examine the performance of EMBPI. And for this, I'm going to uh, compare against existing CP method, including ones beyond ID data, as well as against some non-CP method, especially in traditional time series forecasting like ARIMA, exponential smoothing. And I want to em emphasize again that when we developed EMBPI, it was uh, when at that time there wasn't mu that much development for time series in CP. So that is why against a CP baseline, the comparison were not that up to date, but the latest one uh, is, so that is why we also have the spicy one, which in this case, we mainly compare with CP method for non-exchangeable data, including our EMBPI. And then we also compare with some deep learning based forecasting approaches as I will also see. So these are the two lines of our pro, uh, comparison. The first is against EMBPI and the second is against SPICY. It's our latest one. So first I will just digest what everything is shown here. So every the highlight part is the performance of EMBPI. And here what we do is that we are testing this against different CP baseline on a solar power prediction data set. So in, in the solar data set, it's a natural time series setting because you can view it as a generation by your solar pad, a solar generator. And itself definitely have dependency because of how much sunshine experiencing over time. Or And then what we are doing is we are exp examining the coverage and width under different amount of training data. So as shown here, the training ratio is the amount of training data as a per percentage of whole data. So when, when I say 0.01, it means that suppose I have a, a thousand data point in, in whole, I'm using the first 100 to train a model. And then the rest 900 points are used as the test phase. So different CP methods are essentially what we propose and several other ones. I wouldn't go into detail to each of them, and you can find the details in paper, but essentially some of them are for exchangeable data, but some of them, some of them are not. And in here, the target coverage is 90, 90 per, 90 percent, so more, meaning 0.09. So how, can inter how you can interpret the, the table is essentially, first we look at the coverage. So whether that is actually reaching or approximating or very close to 0.09. And then under this case, what would be the width? Because in general, if your interval is very, uh, white, it generally can cover better. But then, but then it doesn't. Uh, but in, in, uh, but on the other hand, if your interval is not covering desirably, then meaning this CP method is not performing that well. And in general, we can see that our method never loses the coverage, regardless of how many training data you have. Whereas other methods, except for this adaptive C CI, they are going to suffer, uh, even if you're allowing them to use 20% of the training data. And of course, when you use more training data, these methods also seem to improve, but the performance can be not that stable. Oh, sorry. 
And in particular, I also want to emphasize that in this table, both the coverage and width are different, meaning that our method maintains the valid coverage of 0.09, whereas others don't. But on the other hand, ours also have a wider interval where others can be narrower. So natural, so a natural question is, how does the method perform when every every method is predicting like on average the same same similar well on average predicting the interval with similar width and then we can examine what the coverage. So that is why I want to say that in general in the paper we also have additional results where assuming the interval width are roughly the same, what is the coverage? And in those cases we will still see that the MBPI can maintain the coverage. Whereas other methods, their coverage can increase. Like this one, when it is 0.74, it can be like, like say 0.85, but still it will have the under coverage issue. So in the sense that EMBPR is, is quantifying coverage at a valid level with a narrow interval. And what this figure shows is a closer look uh, visually of how EMBPI performs. So in this case, we are examining the conditional coverage at each hour. So a little more uh, into this, a little more into the setting is when we consider the solar panel data, it has observation at each hour, like 9, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., etc. And then we are using all the data from all, all of these hours to construct the interval. But then here we are also sometimes interested in seeing, okay, I don't just want to examine coverage averaging over all the interval and every hour but simply at a specific hour. So suppose I care about my generation or coverage at a specific hour, then how does that perform? So essentially what this figure is showing is exactly that. We restrict or consider the interval uh, evaluated at different hour, and then we are, we are plotting the original prediction, which is showing this red curve here, and then we are showing overlaying the actual prediction interval in, uh, in blue here. And the bottom row in each of the small figure is essentially showing you the rolling coverage uh, with respect to time. And we can see that, of course, rolling coverage is varying because what CP guarantees is on average over all the data points, you can have this coverage. But it's not saying at it's not saying that instantaneously it is always going to cover. So that is why we are still seeing some variation. But I want to say that in, in on average, uh, I didn't show the number here on average the coverage at each of these hours is also what we want, which is 90%, even though the data itself is, is a marginal over each of the, uh, is a marginal over all the hour. So, so in, the, in that sense, this figure essentially shows the valid conditional coverage as well. And now besides comparing EMBPI with the existing CP approaches, we also compare with non-CP approaches. So meaning that of course, uh, dealing with when dealing with time series, conformal prediction might not be the first thing people think of, especially when giving their many original already development. So that's why the first group work at that time we were comparing with some other existing methods like a Riemann exponential smoothing dynamic factor, etc. And also in this table we compare with the best performing conformal baseline in the previous slide. So 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 in, in this the, I think the takeaway here is that on the same data set our proposed EBPI can always maintain the valid coverage. And here we examine coverage not at a uh, varying percent of training data, but examining at, at varying level of significance level. Meaning in practice, suppose we want to quantify uncertainty very very exactly, then we can, I mean, we, we, may, we may actually want a wider interval at like a 95%. So that is why we're examining, does EMBPI always work at different level? So, and the, the answer is yes. So that is why we can see, even if you change your alpha, the MBPR is roughly the same. Of course, when your alpha is smaller, your interval is wider because naturally you want to quantify uncertainty more tightly or have a better way so that you have to have a wider interval. But on the other hand, uh, but on the other hand, the com competing CP method, may, uh, competing time series method may not directly uh, work on these, even after we try to tune them, either because of the underlying assumption or because they just require more extensive uh, understanding of how the data is behaving rather than can already do a plug and play idea. And here, so after presenting the main EMBPI uh, idea, I'm going to show what SPICY does. So SPICY is our main, uh, our most recent development. So, and here I also highlighted here. And the EMBPI is again, what we originally proposed, but, he, but we are just using it here as a baseline as well. And this table is showing uh, 
three different data sets. And the first data set is a wind power data set. And the second is an electric demand data set. And the third is the same solar panel data set. So each of these is a time series, but it's still, they're univariate, just to make sure. And the target coverage is 90%. And essentially what we do here is we're trying to examine the coverage at 90 per, uh, the coverage of different baseline when we're using it in a fair fashion and then and then after uh, exam after examining coverage what would be their width and in particular besides just comparing with cp methods including like emdpi adaptive ci and the non-exchangeable ci so the detail of the detail of the of the, of the these two can be found uh, in the paper. So besides comparing with this line, uh, this baseline, we also compare with some probabilistic forecasting approaches. So the DPAR, I'm sure a lot of you may be familiar, is called the Deep Autoregressive Model, uh, developed by Amazon researchers. And I think that is a very well-known one. And also we compare with a later one called Temporal Fusion Transformer. So all of these ones are popular, especially in multivariate forecasting setting. So we actually are encouraged to use this. But the, after explaining the baseline, I want to indeed show that we see after tuning, all the methods can indeed get valid coverage. Like in, in many cases where uh, methods seem to overcover, meaning we, wa we want to have 90%, but sometimes they're just covering every everyone is above this. But nevertheless, even though we are, even though spicy or other methods are overcovering, the width of spicy is actually much narrower than other methods. So how you can interpret this is that uh, we can act, we can both have a valid coverage and a narrower interval. And in particular, if we lower your significance level, meaning suppose if it's not, uh, sorry, it's not lower. Suppose I, yeah, uh, suppose I lower significance level to be not point, uh, not point one, but something even smaller, then spicy can still cover, but the coverage can be probably even higher or not. So what I want to take away is at the same coverage, the average width of spicy is now is uh, uniformly seems to be better than the other baselines. And here the entries in the bracket are essentially the standard deviation across different ones. And I do want to have another comment that for this method, like a DPAR and temporal fusion transformer, we have to actually uh, calibrate them or do extensive hyperparameter search in order for them to have this valid coverage. Because in general, they are not performing that well if you don't tune them. So what this figure shows is essentially the result of rolling coverage. As we, if you remember uh, several slides ago, we showed similar one for EMEPI. But here, we are not considering each hour, but it's just a marginal thing. And in, in essentially, the black curve is a, is a spicy one, where the uh, orange curve and the other ones are other CP method. And the takeaway is that if you look at the rolling coverage, all the methods seem to be reasonably good, meaning they are always centering or fluctuating around this 0.09 curve. But if you look at the rolling width, it seems that spicy is very stable. Its width is always about this level. Whereas if you look at, uh, I mean, this, this level of smallness, whereas if you look at other methods like EMBPI or other approaches, they seem to be have a decreasing trend, meaning if you have if you're predicting further into the future, likely because when you're predicting further into the future, you will also have more data available uh, in terms of feedback. So in the sense, when you have more data, this method tends to be performed reasonably well or their performance tends to increase. But initially, on a rolling fashion, uh, they, are not, they can initially be poor. So that is, I think, an interesting takeaway where the rolling performance at any snapshot of time is actually still good for EMBP, uh, for SPICY. And we in the in the table we, in the paper we show this for more data sets, but I'm just taking these out as a illustrative examples. And this is also something interesting that I want to I want to point out. So this is showing the so-called multi-step ahead prediction. So what this means is that in previously, what I said is at each prediction time, I'm going to give you one interval. And then suppose I observe the y. And then I'm going to say, okay, now I know the why, and then and then I know what, whether it is covered or not. I can then leverage this new information. But what multi-step does is that, suppose due to the nature of your data, I'm not going to collect feedback instantaneously. Uh, but, but instead, I have to construct multiple intervals at once before I actually go into observe the feedback. So this is essentially what we do. So in A and B, 
we're using EMBPI to construct one interval each time, whereas in B, we are constructing four interval at once. And then after these four interval, we are going to leverage all the feedback and then keep doing this four step prediction. Um, and then we do the same thing for SPICY, either one step or four step. And I think the interesting thing is that Despite the despite valid coverage, so again the coverage is a, is not uh, is the target coverage is 0.09. Despite the valid coverage, spicy has a natural tendency to increase the width of your interval. So the width here is uh, 3.89 when you're doing four step, and when you're doing one step is 2.65. And why this is meaningful is because we can imagine naturally we are predicting further into the future. In the case, for example, if familiar like Arima, then when you predict future into the future, naturally there will be more uncertainty in your data. So this is indeed captured by SPICY. And although we show this one and four, in general, if you predict further, this tends to further increase. So this is actually covered by SPICY. Whereas if you use the MEPI, we realize that marginally it is doing good. But in fact, its interval is not adaptive with respect to the prediction horizon. And in and in, in, and in particular, the four step ahead interval can actually be wider, uh, be narrower in than one step ahead. So in this respect, the use of EMPI in this more challenging setting is probably limiting. Meaning people have we have to develop more as well, both in the theoretical aspect and in critical aspect. And I'm happy to explain how I actually do this four step ahead because it involves the fitting of a multi step predictor as well. But um, I can explain the details later. So essentially, this the takeaway is when you're predicting multiple steps, SPICY can capture this uncertainty, the growing uncertainty, better. And lastly, we also have a result called the stock price prediction, as requested by some reviewer. So especially this adaptive CVI idea, when they first pro, uh, propose it, they show great performance on stock market data. Although we are not able to get the exact data because we realize it doesn't share it, we can actually we, we, we took some data from Kaggle data sets, and then we are trying to predict everything as well. Then we realized that on these different type of market data sets, we can also have a valid coverage at a narrower width uh, in most respect. And sometimes adaptive CI can have can be valid, but sometimes it cannot. So in the sense that uh, we do see that we do see that spicy is in general better. But still, for example, if you look at the last company, both methods are not covering what we want. So this, so the takeaway for this aspect is this is not uniform, universally spicy or other methods going to work. But in general, we realize spicy seem to be a, have seem to get a slightly better performance in those in in general. And after uh, after proposing those main parts, I want to highlight several extensions as well, which I think are some relatively new area of of CP. But I do want to highlight them. So the first is the conformal anomaly detection. So when we had one workshop paper where the idea is essentially classifying all the observations that lie outside the interval as anomalous. And here we essentially, so this work, work was initially proposed using the MEPI idea. So we don't know when you use SPICY, how does that work? But what we do here is we have different traffic sensor and we know a priori what are anomalies. But of course, the algorithms themselves don't know. And then we're wrapping, wrapping EMEPI against different point predictor like rich regression, random forest, neural network, or even RNN with, L with, with LSTM units. So in this case, we can see that if you report the F1 score, EMEPI under the RNN is actually giving you the best uh, F1 score. And in all these baselines, some of some of them are uh, by some of them can are unsupervised. Uh, anomaly detector and some of some of some of them are supervised. So I think this is a promising direction for CP as well. But I but this is uh, again I want to emphasize this ongoing work and I think a lot of new extensions are already there. So but if you're interested, I'm happy to chat more. So this was originally uh, appearing in the ICML 2021 workshop. And another extension is we want to actually consider prediction set for time series. So in this case, what it means that, remember in my original work or in this paper setup, we're assuming your Y is, is continuous, like the stock price or wind power generation, which are just a numerical number. But in general, if you're doing a prediction or the classification, then your Y is categorical, like it has K category. Uh, it can belong to a possible K category. Then 
you can no longer use a residual because the residual in this respect is not that meaningful. Or although you can probably define something similar, it's not going to work that well. So the idea is that you have to consider alternative conformity score. And for this case, we also borrow something from the literature, but then wrapping the original like EMBPI idea around it. And in particular, in this case, we can actually, we, we're using a pedestrian satellite image data set, uh, and then we can still see that across different level of significance level, the MBPI seems to have a valid coverage, but at a slightly or significantly smaller coverage, a smaller set size. So I think this is also interesting to see that uh, this idea can be generalized to giving you point prediction, besides giving you point prediction for continuous random variable, but also give you the prediction set for categorical variable. So I want to lastly highlight several of the ongoing work. So the first is want to get more understanding of the theoretical aspect of spicy. So remember when I say spicy, it was for the, it was for the, uh, we were applying random, uh, quantile, random, quant quantile random forest to the residual. But we can also consider other methods like kernel regression or other things, which can actually help us to get the convergence guarantee or convergence rate guarantee of your prediction. And in that respect, it can, uh, in principle, we can assume you need less data to perform equally well. And the second is, we didn't. I didn't talk too much, but it's an important part of extending conformal prediction for multi-dimensional time series. So in this respect, you can assume each of your y as a univariate, uh, your y i now is y one up to y i k, where it's like a k uh, station. And then we want to jointly construct a set for all of these k uh, random variables at a current snapshot. And for this task, there has been several work like the copula idea, where the copula idea essentially is giving you a small interval at each of these units, uh, each of the coordinate, but at a different different significance level. But we want to also extend this beyond copula style, but using like more general shape. And the last thing that I think is also interesting is, I think this work has been explored as well, is uh, how can you do change point detection? Meaning for in change point detection, we are saying, my original data has a follows a certain unknown distribution, but after a certain time, this is going to follow another distribution. And I want to quickly detect this because if you detect it, it can help you to perform like some preventative action. And in particular, this there has been some idea to extending the QSUM method, which is if you're familiar, it's a type of change point detection algorithm. And but the original QSUM was for likelihood ratio. But then if you can do this for general CP method using non-conformity score, this will be also good. So these are several ongoing work that I think will be valuable and happy to chat more. So in general, I would give a summary of the, uh, the work. So what we do here is first, I want to say that the, the conformal prediction offers distribution free and model free at certain quantification with guarantee. Again, what distribution free means is that we don't have to assume anything about how your Y is, di is distributed or your X is distributed. And the second, when I say model free, it is saying, I don't have to assume what my predictor is. Of course, there is a mild assumption, but that is indeed much wilder than what people typically assume. And the guarantee here part is that if you are if you are more prediction, it can guarantee you what you produce is going to cover one minus alpha percentage of time. And then we develop two approaches for conformal prediction in the time series setting. The first is the EMBPI, uh, which consider mainly rolling residual plus the ensemble predictor. And for the SPICY, it's an adaptive estimation of the residual quantile. And you can find the GitHub links in the paper. And I have some QR code here where you can scan. Uh, and the site, of course, is available. So you can, you can have this. And the lastly, the EMBPI has been implemented in several packages that I think is worthwhile to explore. Okay, thank you for your attention.